My guest this week is Will Beckett, the incredible co-founder of Hawksmoor Restaurants. I can't tell you how much I enjoyed talking to Will about everything from his childhood growing up in a self-confessed foodie family to building one of the country's most iconic steak restaurants. In a time where eating out feels like a privilege more than ever, I adored hearing Will's deep love and connection with the brand he has painstakingly built. Passionate and brilliantly funny in recounting his entrepreneurial journey with several failed restaurants under his belt before embarking on Hawksmoor. Will's story is testament to that true entrepreneurial spirit, grit and determination to build a business doing what he loves. Bow your head and let your eyelids close on down Where we're going you won't need to bring your frown I'm Holly Tucker, and welcome to Conversations of Inspiration. Back in 2006, I founded Not On The High Street from the kitchen table, and since then I've gone on to launch Holly & Co. I'm the UK ambassador of Creative Small Businesses, and I believe that having a business doing what you love is the key to a happy, fulfilled life. My dream is to help everybody start theirs. I'm here to offer advice, inspiration, wisdom and encouragement. And in my view, the best way to do this is by sharing stories. So I've reached out to my favourite small businesses, entrepreneurs and those who simply inspire me and asked them to share theirs. With thanks to NatWest, who have helped bring this free podcast to life. Here are my conversations of inspiration. Hello, Will. Thank you so much for your time today. I'm a huge fan of your restaurants. I was just telling you before I started recording, your face has been cut out on my wish list of podcast guests for so long. And so I love the fact that I'm able to look at you now and we're going to do this. So welcome to Conversations of Inspiration. Thank you very much. It's a a lot of pressure you've put on with your intro there. <laughs> I think you're going to rise to the challenge. I know it's been a labour of love over the last decade, uh, we're along with your co-founder, Hugh, and you've built something pretty cool. Before we get into the childhood and where this all began, I see that you're in your office, is that right? I am. I'm in our pokey office in Shoreditch. And have you been there throughout this period of time or have you recently returned to the office? I mean, we were there probably sort of a bit longer than we should have been in March, really, just trying to kind of deal with the fallout of it all. Mm. And then kind of during lockdown, maybe one or two people used the office, like one per floor or something, people who really couldn't work from home. Restaurants opened up on the 4th, didn't they? Our first one opened up on the 9th. Yeah. And we've been slowly all coming back to work since then. And hopefully, I think kind of within a couple of weeks, we'll have most people back at work, part-time at least. Is it nice to be back? It is nice to be back. It's funny, you know, as someone who worked right throughout lockdown and who's been in a lot of public places since then, it all feels very normal to me. But there's someone who's come back to work today who's on their first day back, who's kind of like a little bit on edge. But I think everyone just likes seeing the people they enjoy work with. It's been a really nice experience coming back. As I said, I always like to start this podcast with a bit about your childhood. And I know that you grew up one of four children in a very busy and I think you've said it's quite chaotic household. And your mother was a highly respected food and wine journalist. And it's just amazing, isn't it, that these elements of our lives can be installed at such a young age and that you've carried on to grow what was really right at the beginning of your life. Can you tell me about this? Yeah, it's funny, actually. I mean, my parents separated when I was about 10 and my dad really, really likes business. But if we're being honest, isn't particularly interested in food or drink at all. In fact, he doesn't drink. My mum is a food and wine journalist, couldn't be less interested in business. So I've somehow managed to combine (laughs) two things that my parents like, but... um, make it my own somehow. One of the things I loved when researching you, I want to say stalking you, but that's a bit negative, but I definitely loved reading how your mum was, there was nothing revolutionary that got onto your kitchen table. These were meals from a tuna sandwich to egg and bacon, but somehow she put that twist on things. Your food was always delicious. Is that right? Yeah, that is right, actually. And if I think about Hugh, you know, who I've known since that period of my life, since we were 11... The same's true from his family, really. You know, our parents were just really good cooks and interested in food, but in that kind of way where you just buy good ingredients, you cook them simply and well. And you're right, you could have a tuna sandwich, 
but it would just be an absolutely exceptional tuna sandwich. And maybe if I think about it like that, actually, that's something that we've kind of taken through into restaurants, which is nothing particularly revolutionary, but just really, really caring about what we buy and, and cooking it really well. And so from that young childhood, you went on to Nottingham University and then attended UCL to take an MA in modern history. And you were sort of encouraged, weren't you, to do a normal job, whatever that is. But that whole time, you didn't actually realise that work could actually make you happy. So firstly, tell me, you did eat shit at uni, did you? I did, yeah. OK, good. Yeah, everything was kind of heated up, everything was baked beans or whatever or like there was always one person we lived in like a house of seven of also like mad chaos the whole time everyone had one thing that they could claim to i can make an actual plate of food here let's have it <laughs> whereas hugh i think you know hugh's always been able to cook and he's been great at that but you're right i mean i had this kind of weird thing where at school and then at university i really just did what i was interested in what kind of made me happy and not quite often actually my my dad, in particular, would say, I really just think you're picking completely the wrong subjects. You know, I did Russian at university. <laughs> it's not going to do you any good <laughs> reading Russian and trying to get a job afterwards. But I just did what I liked. But then because of that, I guess I thought that wouldn't necessarily lead to anything. It just made me happy. When I was at school, I worked in, you know, industrial temping in kind of sheet metal factory or whatever online. I've done teaching. I've done ad sales. I've done all sorts of things. But always, really, because I kind of mistakenly, in the end, assumed work is what you do to earn money, yep. but it is almost, by definition, not pleasant. And the rest of your life is the stuff that you do to just be happy. And that was definitely kind of a view of mine growing up. But then one day, your childhood friend Hugh approached you and asked if you might be interested in starting a restaurant with him. Will you share that story? Because for someone who didn't realise the two could connect, was that sort of a bit of a light bulb moment? Mm, no, possibly. So I've known Hugh since I was 11. We grew up two roads apart. You know, we were in and out of each other's houses every day after school, hung out the weekends, you know, went through the whole of school life in each other's pockets and then went off to different universities and I quite liked studying and he did not. <laughs> and he was always kind of anxious actually to like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna like sort of do something on my own. I'm gonna, but he doesn't like business particularly. He just wanted to sort of do something on his own. He's, you know, he's really into food and yeah, in 2003, both 26 years old and I, I was doing a job I didn't like. I was thinking about whether I should kind of have another crack at going back to university. He got an agreement to take over this Bengal fried chicken shop <laughs> right on the edge of Shoreditch at the top of Brick Lane. He's like, oh, we're going to do a cool bar. Do you want to come and do it with us? It's a nice idea that actually that would have been a light more moment of, yes, oh, this is fantastic. This is exactly what I want to do with my life. It was more like, I mean, I just genuinely haven't got anything else to do. Like, I, uh, it sounds like prolonging enjoying your life and being young and didn't sound like real work. So I leapt at the opportunity of doing that. And that's what we did. We did a little bar in, um, in Shoreditch. And it was great. We really, really loved it in all sorts of ways. It was a great bar and it was a hopeless business. But I think probably over time I realised I like the industry, I like the environment, I mm -hmm. like the people. And that probably kept me hooked for a bit longer. Were there these moments of reality throughout that where you were realising, hang on a minute, we're working all the hours, not making much money here? You know, it didn't feel like work. You know, I remember kind of literally kind of like trying to make holes in walls with like a jackhammer. And I remember doing, you know, 90 hours a week shifts and, you know, finishing at three and being back in at eight. And But I never remember thinking, oh, God, I'm going to work. If I look back on it, I also didn't probably take it seriously enough. Mm -hmm. I and mean, if I think back to some of the conversations that I had with people then about this is how I think bars work. I mean, I, I literally knew nothing. The opposite of something, actually. I knew less than nothing because everything, all the opinions that I held were wrong. <laughs> But it's that medium, isn't it? It's that happy medium yeah. of kind of you can do something you love, but you've also got to take it really seriously and do it properly. If you're going to do something well, do it properly. Absolutely. That lesson probably didn't come until quite a bit later. It's also that thing, isn't it? I was speaking recently about naivety. Actually, it's a really beautiful thing at the beginning. You know, naivety is the reason why... We just jump in and we're not scared and we have no reason to be confident and yet we fake it till we make it and we do it. And then there's that moment, isn't there, where naivety needs to turn to optimism, but optimism needs to be kept in its place. So it's a complicated one, isn't it? Yeah, it's funny. I talk about that with people at work quite often and you're right, like naivety, 
there's no way I'm sitting here today or Hawksmoor exists if we hadn't been ridiculously naive, you know, because that first bar failed. The second thing we did, which is a, a Mexican bar and restaurant, failed. The third thing we did, which was a pub, failed. The fourth thing we did, which was Hawksmoor, was extremely close to failing. I mean, what point are you going to give up, you idiot? And it wasn't even because we were like, no, 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 we will succeed. It was really just we didn't even notice that things were failing. We just sort of <laughs> pop, 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 you know, through our reasonably enjoyable day-to-day -day existence. But then you're right, like, if you can marry optimism and realism or pragmatism, yeah. I think that is a pretty essential part of making it further. What do you think kept you going now you look back? What was that golden thread that you sort of can now sew between those experiences? By saying golden thread, you're looking for like a real nugget that someone might enjoy. <laughs> I think possibly like fear of having to get a real job might be yeah. the most driving force. And just the fact that we loved what we did and there was always kind of another idea. There was always something that we thought might work. And we are both optimists mm -hmm. and I guess that helped. But we borrowed the way that everyone gets set up. You know, we borrowed friends, family and credit cards and whatever, personal loans, get first thing open. Second and third, we got bank debt. Yeah. And with Hawksmoor, we had a verbal agreement from our bank manager that he would lend us the money again. We signed the lease and we kind of got on with it. And when we came back to just make good on our verbal agreement, we found out that he'd been fired and replaced by someone who didn't really think his verbal agreement amounted to much and who felt that if we'd failed three times in a row to make any money, that was probably not a good sign that he should lend to us. So Hugh's parents had to remortgage their home. Well, not had to, but that's what they did. And my stepdad lent me his life savings of 20 grand. That's how we got Hawksmoor open. So tell me about this beginning, because you must have had a clearer vision. The three before Hawksmoor had given you lessons. Tell me about that vision and from personal experience I my parents remortgaged um you know not the high street was going to be dead in the water one I remember one Christmas it was terrible they remortgaged you know life savings went in we were hanging on by our fingertips and it was just really a throw of the dice whether we were going to survive or not but we knew we had to keep going was it the same for you Hugh described it at the time because, we, you know, we were about to go bankrupt and kind of lose everything. He described it as, it's like I'm in a car and we are speeding down a hill as fast as it possibly goes and I've just realised we haven't got a steering wheel or a brake. <laughs> it's weird because as soon as he said it, I was like, oh, my God, that is exactly how it feels. It did feel like everything was kind of out of control, really. And, I mean, I guess their faith in us amounted to something personal, I think, not rational. Probably it was around that time that we started doing that, OK, I think we should take this seriously. Mm. As for a vision of Hawksmoor, there's two versions of the story we tell, and both of them are kind of got a slight oversimplification, if you like, for depending on the audience. One of them is we'd travelled all around the world and we'd been to lots and lots of places and steak restaurants and we'd seen X, Y and Z and... We felt there was this real kind of gap in the market. This is a good story for money people, right? Totally. <laughs> I could hear it. More than one person's fallen for that one, <laughs> Well, hey, why can I spot it? I might have done quite a similar thing. Yes, yes. OK, nice, nice. The gap in the market lie. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, we just felt that we could do something great and British mm. here in Britain that felt like that was the gap. Uh, yeah, and then the other one is... We bought this Turkish restaurant on Commercial Street, which was all we could afford. And because we couldn't get a loan, we didn't have any money left and it had a grill. So we thought, let's just keep the grill. And then suddenly you get a steak restaurant. So, you know, that both of those things have some element of truth in them. And then probably the kind of like the real vision of what Hawksmoor might become or the kind of platonic ideal of Hawksmoor just crystallised in our head over sort of three or four years after we opened it. I think that's always the way. I think that potentially people, those who are listening or those who are listening, looking out at other people and certainly founders as successful as yourself, they look and say, well, you must have had that vision from the beginning. You know, that sort of understanding, as you said, a nice little mix of the gap in the market with steak and attention to detail with that grill. And what I love about these stories is so often... The grill was accidental. 
these accidental moments that start building the DNA of what your vision is. I suppose it's like bringing up a child. You know, you watch them grow. That is who they are now, rather than thinking that you knew your child from the age of three months old. Well, of course, no personality had developed. And I always like to look at that as an analogy, using children and businesses, because that's what happens, isn't it? They literally grow in front of you and you're sort of there as the parents understanding the qualities that are better or worse and what ones to write home to the grandparents about and what ones to keep very, very quiet about. I'm only laughing because I've got three young children. I'm like, oh, yeah, that does sound right. <laughs> um, no, you're, you're absolutely right. And it's interesting, you know, Hugh and I have spent, we've worked together for 17 years and known each other for 32, but we've spent a lot of time talking about how we work together and we're so different. One of us is probably a bit more the kind of person who likes to think about things in advance and do them. The other one is the kind who likes to kind of get engaged with something and then sort of see where it goes. But I think probably all the stuff that we've done best has involved us slowly iterating something. You know, let's do this, then we'll tweak it, then we'll go in the other direction. And we kind of pass it around between ourselves, really, to the point where we get it as close as possible to what we eventually want to do. Mm -hmm. It does take us time. In fact, we've frustrated people with it in the past of just how long it takes us sometimes to just really kind of throw an idea around and make it happen. And I think Hawksmoor was kind of like that. Do you think that that's been something that's been beautiful about the building of Hawksmoor, the two founders having this these two areas of expertise, in a sense, coming together, and then that vision being really the collective of two people rather than one? Yeah, I do think that. I mean, we used to joke that between us, we might just about be one decent business person. Uh, but on our own, we were hopeless. <laughs> the other one we used to say a lot was, if we were on our own, I'd probably have a, a reasonably big, mediocre restaurant company and Hugh would have the world's greatest idea. <laughs> it was completely unfinished. Hawksmoor is so easy. If you know us well and you know Hawksmoor well, I, I think people who've been here for a long time say it was. it's so easy to see how it is kind of like a blend of the two of us. Mm. People put an enormous amount of their soul into the business. Maybe there's a stage where that's no longer true, but no one else can ever really replicate that bit of it, can they? Because you just can't fully understand it. So, I mean, Hugh and I look at Hawksmoor all the time and, and know where it feels short of our ideal. But it's, that's very difficult to do if you don't know each other and yourself as well as Hugh and I do. I think so. And I think you're so right. It's where I try and give those building businesses confidence that it's very difficult to copy energy it's very difficult to copy passion. It's very difficult to copy the late, dark, dark nights, the lowest points of the roller coaster that you share, that then form the next stepping stone, you know, when you start to come out of it. And it's an incredible thing, actually, to build business. Is why I'm obsessed with it. Yeah. You know, it's all of that invisibleness that actually competitors will find very difficult to emulate. But actually, that spirit of a place, when you walk in, they know it's Hawksmoor. They know why it's there. The last 18 months has been really interesting, actually, in that regard, because we definitely have got to a stage where the people who have been with us for the longest at senior level really, to be honest, have understood the culture and what it is that we're doing and, and have proven themselves time and time again more capable, actually, of delivering that than me and Hugh. And that's been an interesting phase. And I think to an extent, actually, they've had to kind of slap us around the face a bit and say, do you or don't you believe that after whatever it is, 7, 10, 15 years working with you, that we've got this now? We understand what it is that you're trying to do, especially in our areas of expertise, to which actually the answer, you know, when you search your heart was, yes, actually, I do think that. So mm -hmm. some of those people have taken more and more responsibility for running the business day to day and week by week and month by month. But going back to what you said about the kind of the dark, sleepless nights, you know, when March happened and everything kind of turned to shit in almost no time at all, that was a moment, actually, of just like, oh, OK, I kind of feel like... I'm needed. Yeah, I need all of that on my shoulders, really. Like, if I'll do the... Well, I mean, I, hope, I think they probably will say they had some sleepless nights as well, but, yeah, the, the going through the wall first a little bit felt relevant to me anyway at the time. Maybe they experienced it differently, but it was, uh, it was difficult. 
In the last series, I gave you the chance to win a one-to-one -one mentoring session with me, and I am thrilled that I'm doing the same this time. Plus, there'll be 10 opportunities to win specially tailored business mentoring sessions from the NatWest Entrepreneurship Managers. This team have coached tens of thousands of startups and business owners across the country so they know their stuff. To be in with a chance to win, all you need to do is sign up to the NatWest Business Builder using our code. The Business Builder is a completely free e-learning site full of information and advice covering everything from well-being to finance. Head to natwestbusinesshub.com forward slash Holly Tucker for all the details. Now, as you know, each week we run a competition with NatWest, who give away their ad break to small businesses and independents. They truly believe in the power of small and want to give you the opportunity to showcase your business to tens of thousands of listeners. So without further ado, let me hand over to this week's NatWest Independent Ad Break winner. Hi, we're Flory and Jason, the founders of Gloriously Good. We handcraft aromatherapy products for the mind, body and home. Gloriously Good aromatherapy candles are hand poured with natural soy wax and fragranced with only pure essential oils such as lavender, ylang, -ylang rose geranium, peppermint and many others. As they fill up your home with an enchanting fragrance, they also have mood boosting effects. Alongside our candles, you may like to experience gloriously good body scrubs made of mineral-rich dead sea salt, which leaves the skin silky smooth. Or to enjoy aromatherapy on the go, we invite you to discover gloriously good pulse point roll-on oils, which are also infused with pure essential oils. Handcrafted in our studio in Surrey, gloriously good products are natural, vegan and cruelty-free. To find out more, visit gloriouslygood.net and follow us on Instagram at gloriously underscore good. If you'd like to take NatWest up on their generosity and be heard by tens of thousands of people, we've created more information on what we're looking for at our website, holly.co. Now, let's get back to our conversation of inspiration. Tell me about Hawksmoor in its DNA, because for those who are listening to you, salivating already, tell me about what it ended up. So three, four years in, how do you summarise what you had ended up building? There's a will answer and a hue answer, to be honest. So the hue answer probably is something to do with integrity or intentionality or care. Hugh is obsessive about detail. He's a guy with a lot of integrity. You know, if he wants to go and find a scallop diver, he will spend an absurd amount of time trying to find, like, just the right scallop diver and just the right kind of boat and the right kind of water, and he'll taste 18 different scallop. He's, the amount of effort and care and integrity that he puts into things, and his area in particular is, is food and design, or his two areas, food and design, and... I hope that's now kind of passed on to the point where just generally in Hawksmoor, if you see something mm -hmm. as a customer, you can be fairly sure that a load of thought has gone into it, right? Whether it's a sauce or a pepper pot or a light fitting or where we get the steak from or whatever, mm -hmm. someone's thought about that thing a lot. And I think I said earlier, if you're going to do something, do something properly. That's Hugh's main value set, really, is just do it as well as you possibly can. Because Hawksmoor, for anyone who hasn't been, is not revolutionary. You know, we sell steak and chips in a nice restaurant. There's decent red wine and some cocktails. You know, I could tell it to you in its most simple form and you'd say, oh, I've been to one of those restaurants before or I've been to 30 of those restaurants before. I hope it isn't too subjective to say, I don't think you have, you know, because mm. of the amount of care we put into it. And it, it's always the thing that really niggles if we go into another restaurant, particularly if it's busy, by the way, to feel like the people who own this don't care. Mm. So anyway, that's the Hugh answer. And the me answer probably is something to do with the way it feels to work here or maybe even the way it feels to come in as a customer. So, I mean, you can see me, your listeners can't, but I'm a casual person. Hawksmoor is kind of personified in a way by kind of a casual professionalness. People are very, very good at their jobs, we do a huge amount of training. We take everything extremely seriously. But everybody's so nice and they're casual. They come to work. They're friendly to other people. Probably the main bit of feedback 
that I hear, because I hear more about people and about food, is just everyone always seems so happy here. How do you do that? And the answer really is you care about it for whatever it is. We've been open now 14 years. It makes such a massive difference to us. And I think it pervades everything we do. I think it's why people like being here. Because there's, there's something about Hawksmoor as a member of staff, I think, but also as a customer, you just go in and you are yourself, mm. right? I mean, if you want to go to Air Street, which is a 235-seater beautiful Art Deco restaurant in Piccadilly in the West End of London, if you want to go in there in shorts and flip-flops and no problem whatsoever. In fact, I saw one of our most regular regulars the other day who bizarrely gone and done a red Mohican in his hair eating in our Knightsbridge restaurant for dinner, you know, spending probably 100 quid a head on food. You just go and you are yourself. There's no judgment there. And that is actually quite relaxing in a world where it's not always easy to just go and just be you. That's a huge part of it for me. It's just I get to be me at work. And not a lot of people have that. And what I love is that's normally given to the founders or maybe the senior staff, that you get to be you at work, potentially if you've had a team that's lasted a long time. But what I love is that, am I right in saying no one has to wear a set uniform, that they can wear their own clothes? The chefs are in chef whites and the usual, but no, everyone's just wearing their own clothes on the floor. That rubs off, doesn't it, in the ambience of the restaurant? And then it almost rubs off on who those founders must be. What gave you that confidence to have a very nice restaurant, but almost allowing your staff and that atmosphere to be casual? Like a few of these stories about Hawksmoor, there is some intentionality and some luck yeah. or circumstance. So we opened in Shoreditch in a, what realistically was a shitty street outside Shoreditch. I mean, the incredible part really was not that everybody wore their own clothes or whatever. It was that it was an expensive restaurant. Shoreditch did not have any... I think at the time, restaurants where you might spend whatever it was, 50, 60 quid ahead at the time in 2006. But it was so simple, you know, probably a waiter would have shorts at that point and a vest maybe, and they'd put an amazing steak down but on a clean white plate and that was what you had in front of you and that was weird at the time. But we didn't really think about it, it was just kind of kooky. But then I guess the intentionality kind of followed because four years later we opened in the West End, a year after that we opened in the City of London, a year after that, we opened in this, you know, beautiful Art Deco restaurant. And every time we thought to ourselves, do you think we should rein this in? You know, it's, it doesn't sit with what restaurants like this, which, you know, by this point, mm -hmm. Hawksmoor, kind of like massive, you know, high volume destination, well-reviewed restaurants. This is not how people run these restaurants. They have staff with uniforms. You know, each time we decided, no, 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 let's just stick by our guns until we decided... We should stop asking ourselves now. This just is part of who we are. And it's interesting for us in New York. We've been trying to open this restaurant in New York for six years, which, by the way, was due to open on March the 19th. Yes, I was going to ask you about this. We thought, can we really go to New York when no one's ever heard of Hawksmoor? And it doesn't have that kind of like natural organic growth and history by the time you first come in. It's just a new restaurant. And it's in this unbelievably beautiful building. Can we really do that and have everyone being casual again when no one knows who we are. It just comes back to the same thing in the end. It's just who we are. Be yourself at work is just a massive, massive part of Hawksmoor. Do you think that that's the imposter syndrome knocking on your door every now and again? You know, you're in this industry, you've become big now, you've got the awards, you've got everything. Can we still be doing this? But sometimes I also think it's a great thing to keep asking yourself that question because it allows you to sort of definitely, you know, stick. What's that game that we used to play? You're going to stick on that. You know, you definitely, this is now something that you know is going to continue. But other things, when you question it over the years, potentially you should have the fluidity to change your mind. It's blackjack, Holly. You, you've you. pretended there that it's a child's game, but in fact you've given away that you're spending all your time in casinos. I think I've been to a casino three times. Well, you, you say that now, but you're pretty clear on the sticking and twisting. I had such fun. I won every time. That's the problem. Great. You, yeah, I know. And that's why I don't think I can ever go back because I've got a bit of an addicted personality, so I'm just keeping well away from that. <laughs> yes, it's not a child game. Yes, so. It's not a child's game. If you're listening at home, children, no blackjack. No blackjack. Um... Yeah, I don't know about the imposter syndrome thing. Is that only a female thing? Well, I was just going to say in a slightly... I mean, we're a couple of, like, white, middle-aged public schoolboys. <laughs> There's not a lot of prevalence of imposter syndrome amongst those people. There's, in fact, possibly if there was a little bit more, maybe the world would be a better place. Yeah. Um, 
I'm a bit more someone who, once I've made a decision, irritates me a little bit to have to reopen it again. Hugh is someone for whom no decision is ever final, mm. which has its own frustrations, by the way. But one of the great things about it is he will revisit things. And, you know, over the course of, of Hawksmoor period, although an example doesn't leap to mind at the moment, but there have been lots of examples where something that kind of was tipping into being perceived wisdom just gets dropped. The way that we've dealt with that in the end is we've spent quite a bit of time saying at Hawksmoor, almost anything should be able to change. Like it's not essential to who we are, but there's a small number of things that should never change ever. And that being yourself at work one is one of them. One of your core values then, one of your, the things that, you know, I always talk about this, you know, as founders, these are the things that are written in stone for anyone carrying on the brand. There are elements, aren't there? I wanted to touch on passion. And when you've been doing this for quite a long time now, you've sort of realised that you can be happy at work. You've realised it so much that you now want all your staff to be happy at work. What do you think has kept you going? You've got an established business. You want to expand it. You have expanded it. But what do you think are of those moments that get you out of bed? Is it passion? Is it obsession over doing better? Is it continuing to build? Do you still have that entrepreneurial sort of energy around you? Yes, yeah, a really good question. Because I don't know, it's funny as you say the words, although maybe I'm wrong, but instinctively kind of, you know, passion, obsession and entrepreneurial energy don't feel like me. <laughs> happy does. You know, I, I wake up and on a Monday morning and I'm, I'm happy. I like, mm-hmm. I like the idea of going to work. My wife will tell you that I feel happy when holidays finish and we go back to work. And I think if that stopped, I would find it quite difficult, I think, to be someone who is working without feeling happy. So that's one. And Hugh and I talk a lot about um, about the idea of an institution and kind of building something with integrity. And in particular, an idea, I suppose, that we will, of course, have to stop working at some point. Mm -hmm. That goes without saying. I'd like to think that whenever that is, even if it's in 30 years' time, it would be nice, it'd be long for a restaurant, but it'd be nice, that we could look at Hawksmoor and still like the thing that we've built. And I think probably that is kind of the main drive. And so legacy is important to you? Yes, it's a grandiose word for it, but yes. So when you think about legacy and you think about, um, and I, I'd love to talk to you about your ambition to go to New York, because if we go back a bit, you opened your second branch in Seven Dials in 2010, and you've since launched eight restaurants in total, and you were waiting to open in New York. And these aren't small spaces as well. As you said, heritage buildings, architecturally beautiful spaces, decoration. I mean, seriously impressive places. And so that, I suppose, has also been added. Is Has it been added into the stone of the DNA of Hawksmoor? The space that you entertain in will always stand out beautiful in its own right? Yes. You know, if we carved the values in stone, I don't think beautiful spaces would be one of them. But I mean, it's less a value set, isn't it, than just an aesthetic? I think, you know, we try to make sure that Hawksmoor buildings are beautiful, but also that they feel like they've been there for a while. Mm. Our favourite ever bit of feedback, negative feedback about the interiors was when we opened Guildhall in the city and someone came in and they really liked Seven Dials and they said, you know, I loved Seven Dials so much, I really wanted to come here, but I don't think I'll come again because... Having seen Seven Dials, I'm really disappointed you haven't done anything to the building. You've obviously put some tables and chairs in, but it feels like you could have put a bit more effort in. And I didn't, but I thought I could have shown them the Google Maps Street View image at the time, because on Google Maps, which was, you know, six months or 12 months out of date, there was just the facade of a building. It didn't even have any walls. We'd literally put the whole thing together to make it kind of look Edwardian, I suppose. And... It was so effective that someone was like, just, I mean, disappointing that you haven't done anything. Oh, my Um, goodness. So I don't think heritage buildings are an essential, and we have considered doing non-heritage buildings before, but Mm. kind of beautiful spaces that feel like they really belong, I think, is important to us. And so tell me about what then happened in New York, because I know it was a very beautiful space, but with the time that we're living in, did your plans literally immediately stop? Because I know this has been a dream of yours and Hughes for a long, long time. It has. 
there is a Hawks Moor in New York with a sign outside it with full bottles on the shelves with some staff still on the payroll, kind of linger around in New York. I spoke to one of them this morning. And, it, and it's ready. It's ready to go. In fact, it's so ready to go that we did the first, not the, not the soft launch, but we did the kind of the staff, friends and family service on the 12th of March and we shut it all down on the 13th. Oh, my goodness. And it's been there since. And, I mean, indoor dining doesn't exist yet in New York. Again, they, you can eat outdoors but not indoors and we're recording this in September there's no sign of indoor downing being allowed yet. You can't imagine it's happening between October and November. So really, the truth is it will have to open next year now. But I feel committed to the idea that it will one day open. Was it just essential decisions? I mean, of course, because you can have indoor dining. But this period of time, I know you've had to make very difficult decisions. So many brands have. And just recently been out in, you know, I went out, out for the first time. And it was a real, you know, until you do it, you don't realise, you know, there are a lot of things that are different out there. What have you felt that this time has given you in terms of difficult decisions have had to be made. How have you navigated this? And are you going to take some things out of it that will stay with you longer term? It's interesting hearing you say how a lot has changed, because you're right. And we've had that conversation that I hinted at before, actually. We've kind of talked about what can change and what can't change. You know, what should stay the same? And mm. actually, if, if you'd gone out, out to a, to a Hawksmoor... Uh, I think probably one of the things that you would have felt was it feels normal. Yeah. In fact, it feels normal amongst a sea of things that feel abnormal. And to a very small minority of people, that has been very difficult to come to terms with, it feeling normal. Especially when, you know, there are other places doing a whole kind of theatre of safety, going well beyond guidance to kind of mm. signal safe. Mm. And we're not really, we're doing exactly the guidance, doing it very well. In fact, we're a government case study for it. But we are trying extremely hard to make it feel normal. And, you know, if you'd said this to me pre-COVID, I'd have been devastated. But the most positive feedback we get probably is the word normal. Your restaurant feels normal. Thank you. And to me, that means a huge amount. You know, a load of people have kind of guessed here, really, what, what do people want? And our guess was they just want to feel like things are back to normal again, even if it's just for a couple of hours and forget the stuff that's happening outside. And, I mean, things, of course, things will change at Hawksmoor. I mean, we've got seven restaurants open out of eight. Only two of them are open for any lunch services Monday to Friday at the moment. There's all sorts of things. Our menus are simpler. But if anything, I think we sort of sat down and felt loads of people in the restaurant industry are changing their companies now. Lots of them are getting smaller. But, you know, they're changing some fairly fundamental things. We don't feel that. We feel like it was a really nice moment in a way because it's framed the question, are you sure that this is what you want your company to be? Because it doesn't have to be. You could do anything you want, really. Yes. And we've come back with the answer. You know, we already had the thing that we really wanted it to be. We want to kind of double down on Hawksmoorness. Um, so, uh, you know, I think, if anything, it's made us more committed to the culture at Hawksmoor, more committed to the way we think about restaurants and more committed to this industry. So I, I think probably the more interesting part is having thought how little should change. I love that. From the stuff that really matters. I love that. As you said, you, you had the permission, in a sense, didn't you, from anybody, suppliers, customers, to totally change, you know, Absolutely. and they would have forgiven you or accepted it. But actually, you got to, when else did we get that moment to actually say, do I actually love you? You know, really, because I could just walk away or change this or do that, swap you out. Yeah. But you said, yes, I do. And tell me about then your suppliers during this period of time, because I know for Hawksmoor, your suppliers are hugely important. I mean, you just told that story about Hugh and loving food, but not cooking. I didn't even know that these things were a thing. But um, tell me about your suppliers during this period of time, because that is what has been unbelievable, hasn't it, for the restaurant industry. It's not necessarily just been the restaurants, but it's been those that have been supporting you over the years. And how are they going to keep surviving? Yeah, I mean, I think it's worked as I believe it should have done, which is 
that really it's a two-way adult, really positive kind of relationship that we have with our suppliers. You know, we got in touch with them immediately. It's not like our plight was news to them, but kind of we opened up a conversation where we haven't been able to pay. And there have been moments where we haven't been able to pay and when we didn't access any of the kind of government loans and stuff. They were understanding and they gave us some time. We were clear and we talked to them and, and, and whatever. When we were able to pay, we made sure that we did as quickly as we could to make sure that they survived. And obviously we've survived and I, I'm hopeful that will continue to be the case. Confident. But with very few exceptions, they've all survived as well. So we have kind of come through it together. And I think, again, it just gives you a renewed commitment, doesn't it, to the people that you've worked with when you go through this kind of stuff together. Mm. You know, I think Hawksmoor is like that. It's more than just you sell me something, I'll buy it, and then that's it. I think there is a sense of going through this stuff together and they're feeling, us feeling some pride that they are our suppliers and them feeling some pride that we are their customers. All year, together with our friends at Three, we're working to make business dreams come true. Share your aspirations on social using the hashtag Holly and Co Dreamer. And who knows what will come true? With a Three Means Business Plan, I love that you can get up to £500 of benefits from their specialist partners to help give your business a helping hand. Whether you need support with accounting or building a new website, Three have got you covered. Now here's a short story about those that dreamt big and flew. A pioneer of the UK fashion industry for five decades for her free-spirited take on colour and pattern, Dame Zandra Rhodes is one of the most iconic and recognisable fashion designers in the UK. But there was this burning drive and passion within her right from the start. She declared, if I wasn't the best at something, there was no point in doing it. Born in Kent during the Second World War, Zandra's early memories include being held up to the sky to see the doodle bugs and drawing chalk butterflies on an air raid shelter. Introduced to the fashion world by her mother, it wasn't long before her ambition led her to studying at the Royal College of Art in London, where she was able to indulge her love of textiles and began to establish her own distinctive style. Zandra's early textile fashion designs were considered outrageous and were initially hard to sell, but she refused to compromise and it wasn't long before her dramatic and creative garments began to receive recognition from both the British and American market. Blending a unique mix of feminine style with a bold punk aesthetic, Zandra has always dared to be different and challenges the status quo her unconventional and adventurous designs have forever stamped her identity on the international world of fashion. Don't forget to share your own business dream using the hashtag Holly and Co Dreamer. And to find out more about Three's business plans, search Three Means Business. Now, back to Conversations of Inspiration. When you think about what you personally will take through this, so you said that you all asked yourself that question and you sort of said, right, we love what we do. We're going to double down on this. But for you personally, when you think about this grand word legacy that you're building and Hugh, not the high street was built from myself and Sophie. So I understand founder relationship. So when you've got the door shut and you're thinking, crikey, look what we've just got through. Is there something that has been born out of this time that the two of you will carry forward? I'm sure there is. I think really it's just that idea of commitment, really. You know, you you said earlier, I don't love you anymore. Maybe it's time to go. You know, you compared the relationship you have with your business to kind of like a marriage almost. And there's something in that in terms of commitment. You know, everybody goes through the stages of, you know, should I be doing something else? Should I get some ideas above my station? Should I, <laughs> should I take my foot off the gap? Whatever it is. Do I have to work this hard? Do I have to work? Yeah, but why yeah. am I doing this? I mean, also, by the way, you know, I've got, as I said, with three young children, of course you think, what am I doing? Why, you know, anyway, I think if anything, it's just a renewed commitment and that idea of going through adversity together, strengthening somehow the relationship. I think that's probably true 
for the relationships with the people that we work with, but also mm. certainly for me, my own personal kind of relationship with Hawksmoor does feel like we've kind of gone through this together a little bit this year. Will you and Hugh be renewing your wedding vows together? Yes, yeah, funny, we still we grew up two roads apart in St Albans <laughs> and we now live two roads apart in South East London. I'm not sure if our wives would expect us to do more, yet more wedding vowing. I think there's a lot of that already. <laughs> Oh, this has been such an enjoyable conversation. It really has. And I end my interviews talking about the entrepreneurial journey or the journey of building a business and liken it to a roller coaster. If you had to think about your time going right back to your... your Was it a Mexican bar? Is that right? The second one, the Mexican bar. The bar and restaurant was the second one. The first one yeah, was Yeah, that was it, yeah. So if you're there, what would you say has been one of your biggest lows? Oh, I mean, it, it was... It was that Tuesday, what was it, March 17th this year. We have opened in our careers 15 restaurants, eight Hawksmoors and seven things that weren't Hawksmoor. All seven have failed and all eight Hawksmoors have worked. But seeing the thing that you've kind of given your life to and seeing the people who you've really made that kind of commitment to in terms of, you know, the the employer-employee kind of relationship and what that work relationship means to us all and having to shut it all down mm. was definitely the low. And, I, you know, I was, I was quite struck by that and kind of like quite emotional for, for a few weeks, which is not very me. So, yeah, I mean, that was, that was definitely the worst of it. Much, much worse than when we've actually failed for stuff that, you know, we've fucked up. It goes against your very fibres of everything you are when you've tried to make eight work and then you've got to shut them all down when it's working. Yeah. You know, it goes against everything that your your soul's telling you to do as a founder. And what is the opposite? So not much wind going in your hair, but if you were in the top of the roller coaster with the wind in the hair, what would that moment be in your career? I think there are probably three moments that I've really thought, oh, this is... We've done something, and I, my favourite one really was the first service of Hawksmoor Seven Dials in 2010. It wasn't even the service, because actually the service was awful. But one by one, my family and friends... I actually feel a bit emotional. Sorry. One by one, my family and friends came down the stairs. You know, you, you go in on the ground floor, and then you come down into the bar, yeah. and then you go into the restaurant. The space sort of opens up to you as you come down. And one by one, they came down and they almost all had exactly the same reaction, which was kind of like, ha ha, lol, we're kind of, here we are all together going into one of Will's restaurants. Oh my, oh, oh my God. And then they just all, you know, one by one, they went, can't believe you've done this. I'm so proud of you. And that was, that was amazing because it, you know, we'd been through a lot of failure. And at the time, 2010, which is, you know, early financial crisis, doing 6,000 square foot in a basement in Covent Garden was not a good idea, or certainly no one else thought it was a good idea. And then we just, this amazing thing, and you know, you kind of, you forget, don't you, that as you're building this thing, it turns into something that is magical. And that was just like a moment. Uh, and that was, probably, that was probably my favorite ever moment. The way you just described that, I can literally picture, they were bursting with pride for you. You know, they were bursting, they were, they got it. They yeah. understood it. And it was nice because we never, neither my family or my friends, we don't really talk to each other about work at all, neither mine nor theirs. So it's not really a part of our lives together. They do what they do, I do what I do, and then much more interesting is what we all do together as friends. But that was just a one moment, and it was, it was really lovely. Oh, this has just been such a lovely, lovely time, getting to know you. It's been an absolute privilege, and certainly hearing... You describe this period of time which has affected your industry as much as many, but mostly that, you know, you had eight restaurants that you were closing down. I can only imagine what it was like. And I'm so happy to hear that you are fully opening up and you're back at work and you're getting to do what you do best. I love the ethos of your brand, the good it does. And I cannot wait to go out out in one of your restaurants soon. But it's that time now that I'm going to hand over to you, Will. And I know you've prepared a letter to your younger self. And yes, it's just been a, a real privilege. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you very much for having me. And apologies in advance if the letter is either repetitive of stuff that we've said or a bit emotional. 
I'm not sure if I meant it to be that. Do you want me to just read it? I would love you to read it. Yes, please. Thank you. <laughs> so, yeah, a letter to a young Will. Writing this is odd. I'm writing to a person who has no idea what the future holds and no real interest. I'm also writing to a young man who's flawed. You're a nice guy, you like learning, but you're pretty lazy and seem to find it pretty difficult to commit to things or think too seriously about the future. If we're being honest, you probably don't think about other people as much as you should. So where's that going to end up for you? That's the odd thing about this letter. It all ends pretty well. I've got a business I'm proud of, a few hundred people who work here, lovely wife, three great kids. I'm obviously still flawed. Some of those flaws are the same and some of them are different, but I'm happy and you can't really ask for more than happy. Of course, none of this is definite for you. For you, the future's unknown and it may not turn out that way. The truth they don't seem to tell you at school or when your parents are giving you advice is how much of your life is based on luck. In my life, I've had lots of good luck, which has helped me out in many ways, and I've had some bad, and I hope each time that's happened, I've learned something from it. You've already had plenty of both. I've had the good luck to be born into a nice family in the first world country, and good luck to go to a good school, good luck to have been healthy. You've also had a bit of bad luck, mostly your parents separating when you were even younger, but even then, you seem to have learned something from it, so maybe that was lucky in its way as well. The point is, you don't control what happens to you. What you can control is how you react to things and how you make the most of the good luck and how to avoid letting the bad luck break you. And if that's the secret of life, then you can prepare for what's to come. How do you do that? You think about your life as a process of trying to permanently improve. If you can do that, it'll put you at an advantage to a lot of other people who seem to spend much less time thinking about getting better. You're going to need knowledge and skills, but you're also going to need character. Character isn't talked about nearly as much as it should be, and you're not working on it nearly as hard as you should be. A bit of charm and some decent chat is only going to get you so far. You need to be able to stand tall when things are not going well. You need to help other people, even when it's not convenient. And you need the self-awareness to understand who you really are and what your best and worst points are. One thing that you should hold on to, though, is that everything's going to be okay attitude. Looking back at my life, I don't really know where that came from, but I do know that it's one of the most important traits I have. For you at the moment, it's naive. You think everything will be fine and you're not really working that hard to ensure that you're right. As you grow up, you'll learn that if you can couple that feeling with an ability to think clearly about the problems you're facing and come up with answers, then that's probably the main skill you're going to have in life. You should also hold on to the idea that work isn't supposed to be something that you hate but have to do, just because that's the way it works. At its best, work should be right at the centre of your life, up there with your friends and family. Look hard for what you enjoy and don't accept a life of wishing you were doing something else. Lastly, your dad has already had one of his long chats with you, where he talks about the idea that noblesse oblige you're probably not going to think about that chat again for many years, and you probably had no idea what he was talking about at the time. It would have been easier if he'd just quoted Spider-Man. With great power comes great responsibility. You obviously don't have great power, and nor do I, but you do have a nice life and you have things going for you. You should use those things to do more for other people. Hopefully you'll learn that sooner than I did. I wish you good luck, but maybe everything I've said means I shouldn't. I just wish you had what I had, which was a decent knack of riding my good luck and shaking off my bad. If you can do that and you can keep trying to be a better person, I think you'll do OK. <laughs> Thank you so, so much. I, when you were reading that, I just thought to myself, how do I get to be so lucky to hear your story, your letter to yourself? A man who and a partnership that has built such a phenomenal brand, someone who I admire so greatly, and you share with us your story, your letter, full of character. You're just such a nice person. I just wish you so much luck in building what is just amazing. Thank you very much for inviting me on, and thank you for putting me in your podcast pot. Oh. <laughs> Thank you very much. And we might play blackjack one day. I hope so. When we go out, out. Well, no, you win, so maybe not. <laughs> Thank you so much, Will. Thank you. Thanks, Holly. 
before you go, don't forget that to be in with a chance to win a 90-minute mentoring session with me, all you need to do is sign up to NatWest's Business Builder. It's packed full of videos and advice to help you build your business and give you the tools you need. To find out more, head to natwestbusinesshub.com forward slash Holly Tucker. And if you've enjoyed this episode, if it's helped you along your journey or inspired you, would you mind rating and reviewing? Your support means the world to me. It really does spread the word and will help inspire even more people to build a life they love. And if you want to hear all our latest news, you can sign up to my weekly newsletter, Holly's Desk Notes, over at holly.co. Thank you.